Try and imagine that you've been taken away from the life that you know. Imprisoned in a windowless room, you can't see your friends, your families, or have any contact with the outside world. It's cold, dark, and damp, and you're so hungry that you can't even sleep. Now, try and imagine that someone opens the door to that prison and puts down a meal and a thirst-quenching glass of water. You would be thankful to that person. You might even praise them for their kindness, even if it was that same person who had imprisoned you. This is Stockholm Syndrome. On the 23rd of August, 1973, a 32-year-old man named Jan Erik Olsen walked into a bank in Stockholm, Sweden. But he wasn't a customer. He was there to rob it. Jan Erik single-handedly held up the bank, and after shooting one police officer in the hand and making another sit in a chair singing, he took four people hostage in an effort to get the money that he came for. He locked the hostages in the vault and began making his demands, which included getting his friend and expert bank robber, Clark Olofsson, brought to the bank to assist him. The police complied. Over the coming days, whilst the two men planned their escape, the hostages started showing unusual signs of gratitude towards them. In one phone call to the Swedish Prime Minister, Jan Erik allowed one of the hostages to speak. I fully trust Clark and the robber. They haven't done a thing to us. On the contrary, they have been very nice. Other hostages also showed signs of sympathy towards the bank robbers, later saying that they thought that they were perfectly lovely. One of the hostages, suffering claustrophobia from being locked in the small room, expressed gratitude that the men allowed her to leave the vault as long as she had a rope tied around her neck like a dog, saying that it was very kind of Jan Erik to allow her to move around the bank floor. And another hostage, who was told he was going to be shot, was grateful to his captors for saying that they would let him get drunk first. After six long days, the siege finally came to an end. But after all this time, locked in a confined space, fearful for their lives, you would think that the hostages would have shown deep animosity towards the robbers, maybe even hatred. Instead, they praised them for their actions, and it appeared that they even believed they owed their lives to them. From this, the phrase Stockholm Syndrome was coined, a description for when victims gain trust, sympathy, and even love towards their captor. Psychologists who have studied the syndrome believe that the bond is initially created when a captor threatens a captive's life, deliberates, and then chooses not to kill them. The captive's relief at the removal of the death threat is transposed into feelings of gratitude towards the captor for giving him or her life. As the Stockholm bank robbery incident proves, it only takes a few days for this bond to cement, proving that a victim's desire to survive trumps the urge to hate the person who created the situation. Survival instinct is at the heart of Stockholm Syndrome. Victims live in enforced dependence and interpret rare or small acts of kindness in the midst of horrible conditions as good treatment. They often become hypervigilant to the needs and demands of their captors, making psychological links between the captor's happiness and their own. One of the most famous cases of Stockholm Syndrome happened less than a year after the bank robbery that gave it its name. On the evening of the 4th of February 1974, Patty Hurst, a 19-year-old girl from a very wealthy family, was kidnapped from her home in California. She was dragged from the building, kicking and screaming, before being put in the boot of a car and driven away by members of the Sibonese Liberation Army a left-wing, anti-capitalist terrorist organisation. According to Patty Hurst, she was held in a locked closet for the first two months of her ordeal, blindfolded for most of the time and subjected to ongoing physical and sexual abuse. She was told that she might die at any time and was fed propaganda continuously about how the SLA was oppressed by capitalists such as her father 
who they were blackmailing in order to leverage the Hearst family's political influence to free two SLA members from prison. After months of torture, it became evident that she had fallen to Stockholm Syndrome, as she was seen helping the SLA commit multiple robberies and even firing shots at innocent members of the public. Later that year, on the 17th of May 1974, the LAPD finally tracked down the SLA gang to an apartment in Los Angeles where a gun battle ensued in front of the assembled national media. Six members of the gang were killed, including their leader, but Patty Hearst escaped unharmed. But even now her kidnappers were dead. So brainwashed from her ordeal, she continued to fight for the SLA and even recruited new members. Not long after, Hearst was arrested stood trial and sentenced to seven years in prison for her participation in the SLA's crimes. She served a fraction of that and was released in 1979 under stringent conditions. Over the coming years, Patty protested her innocence. However, it was not until 2001 that Bill Clinton finally pardoned her for her crimes on his last day in office. Stockholm Syndrome is very rare, but the underlying definition is scarily familiar. Some believe that we are all, as part of modern society, suffering from some form of it. The theory goes that we, the people of modern Western societies, have also been brutalised into submission by our own ruling classes. So much so that our relations to them are akin to a hostage with Stockholm Syndrome towards their captor. This seemed particularly evident in the most recent US presidential election. Even after Donald Trump harassed, threatened, insulted and intimidated certain people or groups like women, Mexicans, immigrants, Muslims, the disabled and members of the media, people from these groups still voted for him and continue to support him. A common hypothesis to explain the effect of Stockholm Trump Syndrome is based on Freudian theory. It suggests that a victim's ego identifies with Donald Trump and decides to vote for him in order to not feel insulted by his nasty comments. In supporting Donald Trump, the victims cease to view him as a threat and their egos remain intact. But who knows, Stockholm Syndrome on this scale might be immensely difficult to diagnose and maybe the word syndrome is misplaced altogether. After all, it doesn't take into account the rational choices people make in particular situations. It kind of makes complete sense to adapt yourself to identify with your captor, especially if you spend a great deal of time with that person. It's about empathy and communication. Looking for normality within the framework of a crime might not be a syndrome, but simply a survival strategy born from hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. So what do you think? Are we all suffering from some form of mass Stockholm syndrome? Should it even be classed as a syndrome? Let me know in the comments below and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I've been Dom, and you've been watching everything. Hey again, I uh, hope you enjoyed that video. Bit darker than usual, less science-y, but I really enjoyed making it, so I might be making more videos like that. Let me know what you think. But before I go, I just wanted to tell you about my Patreon page. If you're not sure what Patreon is, then check out the video in the video description. But basically, it's a really amazing way that you can support me to keep making these videos. There are a bunch of options starting from as little as a dollar. So if you want to help me, then please head over there and check it out. Also, a massive thank you to Andrew Rice. Hi, Andrew, for becoming my very first Patreon. And thanks to Ali and Micah over at Neurotransmissions for becoming my second Patreon ever. If you don't already know Neurotransmissions, they make loads of cool videos about how your brain works. Really fun, check them out. Oh, and I have to thank my good friends, Rich and Luke, for becoming my number 
three and four patrons. Thank you very much, guys. You could be number five. Just imagine.